So I will be your last uh, speaker for today. And my topic today is the basic and application of research in sociology. Uh, I'm Dr. Noor Azlin, even though the name appear on your screen is Dr. Jismawati. I'm borrowing her PC. Yeah. Hold on. Okay, so these are uh, the outline for my topic of discussion today. Uh, I will define some of the key terms and then I will discuss sociology, the interrelationship between our discipline sociology, research and scientific methods, and foundation of research in Islam. And then uh, briefly, we will see a diagram of social research uh, processes and lastly, application of uh, social research particularly. So as you can see, the word uh, research derived from the two words re and search. Re means you do it over and over again. And search means to examine something thoroughly. So as to present in a very detailed manner and accurate manner about certain uh, phenomena, in our case, social phenomena. So this is basically a literal definition. Uh, next, this is actually a technical definition from Ranjit Kumar. The, uh, he is one of the leading textbook author in research methodology. So research uh, academically or technically can be defined as a noun describing a careful, systematic patient study and investigation in some field of knowledge undertaken to establish uh, facts and principle. Uh, I would flash to you a few definitions. So could you please try to capture a few uh, important keywords in this definition to facilitate our discussion in the next uh, few slides. So personally, I uh, I mean like or love, even love this uh, definition because apart from defining what is research, uh, this definition has actually given us an idea, uh, at least one characteristic of a good researcher, which is you need to be patient because to conduct research, especially say for example, like long term research or longitudinal research, you need patient to be to investigate, to collect data for a longer period of time and not to mention whenever you interview certain of your participants, you might have other challenges as well. So that's why <clears throat> we need patient in order to conduct research. Okay, now uh, I have uh, included the word social research. So this is from <clears throat> American sociologist Balmer. Sociological research as research is primarily committed to establish systematic, reliable and valid knowledge about, of course, social world. So you see the keywords which have been repeated uh, a few times already is systematic. All right. So with that uh, three definition, I want to uh, highlight uh, briefly about relationship of uh, sociology and for that matter are the social science discipline with research and scientific methods. So basically these three terms, especially the two term research and scientific methods are being used interchangeably in many uh, books, especially on research method, and not to mention as well in the introductory book of many uh, sciences, including social sciences. So for that matter, uh, I would like to flash again definition of sociology, which uh, has been discussed by my friends in week one, Dr. Uh, Aisha. So this is from Diana Kendall in her book, uh, sociology of our time, which is uh, an introductory book to sociology. So systematic study of human society and social interaction, as you can see there, this is the focus of our discipline, which is human society and social interaction. You will see more or less similar definition uh, shared by another main textbook author of sociology, John Masionis, systematic study of human society. And lastly, Renziati and Tischler, Scientific Study of Human Society and Social Interaction. So in the earlier week, week one and two, uh, the focus of this definition is on the second part, which is human society and social interaction. But for my topic today, I want you to focus on the first 
keyword of this definition, which is systematic. Okay. Uh, the word systematic being used by Kendall and Marcionis and scientific being used by Renziati and Tischler. So this is to show that the close interrelationship between the scientific knowledge need to be systematic. Okay. Scientific knowledge need to be produced systematically. So that's why these two words are frequently used uh, interchangeably, not only in sociology, but also in many other social science as well as physical sciences discipline. Right, since uh, we have the word science here by Renziati and Tischler, let us briefly define what is science, even though I believe you have come across this definition and even discussion uh, previously. So this is another main uh, textbook author of research method in sociology, W. Lawrence Newman. So what is science? It is both a system for producing knowledge and knowledge produced from the system. So there you go again, you can see the word systematic. So this is the one of the most characteristic, important characteristic of scientific discipline. It must be produced systematically. Okay, so as I mentioned just now, uh, these, um, I, I will highlight few characteristics of science or scientific knowledge. Uh, number one, uh, you must collect empirical evidences. As I think most of you would have known, empirical evidence means those data which have or you will collect using your five basic senses. And then another important characteristic of scientific knowledge, we must use specific technique or methods. Okay. If you are physical scientist, you have your own data collection technique. Similarly, for sociologists as well as other social scientists, we would have our own data collection technique, which you will see, I will share with you in the next uh, slide. And then, as I mentioned earlier, the word systematic appears in all definitions just now. So in order to produce scientific knowledge, we must collect our empirical data uh, systematically. After we have collected our data systematically, uh, the output normally we're going to synthesize in the form of theoretical framework. Okay, so theory is another characteristic of scientific knowledge. And this theory and the uh, last uh, characteristic which is the class characteristic of science that I'm going to share today is uh, scientific knowledge is cumulative uh, by nature because the nature of human society, we undergo uh, changes across time. So correspondingly, the knowledge produced from our data collection should be able to accommodate to the new changes or new social phenomena that affect our society. So that is uh, cumulative. Right, I want uh, to bring uh, your attention to the father of sociology, which my colleague, Dr. Aisha, uh, Dr. Aisha. So she has mentioned this in her lecture, week one, Ibn Khadun as uh, the father of sociology. So uh, this uh, analysis uh, has been done by uh, Fuad Bali in his book, Ibn Khadun, Sociological Thought. So he has analyzed the masterpiece of, masterpiece of uh, Ibn Khadun work, Mukadima, and uh, he found striking similarities of characteristic signs embedded in the work of Ibn Khadun, uh, Mukadima. Number one is empirical. Okay. And then uh, he forwarded a number of sociological generalization. Again, these have been mentioned by my friend, my colleague, on social ecology, a theory on social ecology, a few theories on rural sociology, political sociology, urban sociology, and economic sociology. So these are the five chapters that he has elaborated in his uh, masterpiece, Mukadima. Uh, the six chapters is actually on scientific knowledge and the acquisition of knowledge. Uh, Fuad Bali also mentioned another characteristic of scientific knowledge produced by Ibn Khadud. Her work is cumulative in nature. Okay, so as you can see, they are similar with the characteristic which uh, I have uh, highlighted earlier. 
And he also used special data collection technique in the writing of the six chapters which I have mentioned earlier. So I will elaborate what are the tools uh, technique in the subsequent slide. Okay, I would like to highlight the first <coughs> characteristic of science or scientific knowledge, which is empirical. So if you go to uh, Quranic verses and Hadith, data collection in the form of empirical has been mentioned in numerous uh, Quranic verses, which means to say that uh, conducting research is in line with Islamic teaching. So, there are a lot of uh, Quranic verses. I will merely highlight at least two. This is in uh, Surah Al-Nah, okay, whereby Allah has mentioned, He has subjected for you the night and day, and the sun and the moon. The stars are subjected by His command. Indeed, uh, in that they are signs for people who reason. Even though uh, in this verse, basically Allah highlighted the importance of observing natural phenomena, which is the alternation of day and night. But my uh, point is, Allah mentioned that you need to do your observation. Okay. In this case, uh, natural phenomena. Uh, uh, number one in this verse, the alternation day and night, whereby uh, going back to my uh, argument just now, the first characteristic of sign to collect data empirically. So one of our basic human uh, senses is your sense of sight. So you can observe okay, the changes of day and night using your sense of sight. And also the sun and the moon, you can see the sun and the moon with your eyes, the stars during the night. But all of this will make sense to us okay, if we really take time okay, to ponder upon this phenomena. So that's why Allah always ended up uh, this uh, type of verse with Ya Kilun or in other words Ya Tafakkarun. So in the context of the research, I also want to highlight these are uh, also another good quality to become an effective researcher. You need to always have this ability to think, to reason. Ya kilun, ya tafakkarun. So in the context of sociology, uh, thinking, observing any uh, social uh, phenomena. Okay. Uh, another verse also more or less the same. Very important uh, physical or natural phenomena, alternation of day and night being repeated in many verses. Similarly, in this uh, verse, Okay. In this surah, Ajazia. Uh, and in the alternation of night and day, and in what Allah sent down from the sky of provision and give life, thereby to the earth after its lifelessness and his directing of the wind, a sign of people who reason. Again, even though we live how many years already, depending on your age, uh, on this earth, okay? Uh, I'm not sure whether how frequent we have really uh, stopped, okay, uh, ponder and observe all of these natural phenomena. Uh, alteration night and day, again, your sense of sight and then the sky provision, it refers to rainwater, whereby if you want, you can taste the rainwater. In fact, in many countries, this is the main water supply. Okay, we capture rainwater in order to distribute the water to uh, population. So sense of taste. Okay? And then directing of the winds, you have sense of touch. Even though you cannot see the wind with your sense of sight, but definitely you can feel the impact on your skin. So your sense of touch. So at least in this verse, we have three different senses. Again, Allah ended up uh, this verse with important attributes being an effective researcher ya kilun ya kilun and ya tafakkarun sign for people who reason okay so uh, i'm going to my third uh, topic foundation of research in islam i don't think i would uh, elaborate this uh, at length because uh, the last speaker dr zaki and also not to mention in the previous lecture 
uh, we have highlighted the importance of Tawhidic uh, paradigm. Okay, so as a Muslim researcher, uh, all of our research effort must be guided by Tawhidic uh, paradigm. As a vicegerent, as a servant of Allah, we need to use our research to promote good, okay, um, enjoying good and also to forbid uh, evil. So basically for us as a Muslim researcher, conducting research is a form of ibadah and amanah which also has been highlighted similarly in the uh, last lecture, okay, just now by Dr. Zaki. So in uh, another book by Faridi, uh, I want to emphasize on Tahidi paradigm just now. So quote, uh, research should uh, be fired by a mission to please Allah and to serve mankind. So scientific research in general and social research in particular should not directly or in consequence be harmful to mankind. So this is how we should operate as a Muslim researcher. Okay, I am moving uh, quickly to scientific procedures. So this is basically the other characteristic of science whereby we're going to produce or we're going to collect our data systematically. So in all major textbook or research method and also introductory uh, textbook on social sciences, you would easily find uh, this diagram. Okay. We start with selection of any topic, okay, depending on your research area. Say, for example, my research area is in environmental sociology and one of my uh, topic of interest in water pollution. Okay, then we refine further research topic into a research problem. Then we do some literature review, whereby you need to consult other references in relation to your research problem. If you do uh, quantitative research, you're going to formulate hypotheses. Uh, typically, if you do qualitative research, you're going to formulate a few research questions. After this, then you are good to go. This is what we call the implementation stage. You're going to choose research method and visit your field setting or research setting in order to collect your data. Let's say you're going to spend like maybe six months in your research setting. You come back to collect data and next you are ready to analyze the data. So it uh, applies to both quantitative and qualitative research, which I will highlight the differences after this. And the final stage is writing our research report. So whether you are a physical scientist or social scientist, these are the systematic step that we have to go through in order to complete our empirical research. Okay, so as you can see, uh, my point here to show this diagram is everything needs to be done systematically one after another. So this is basically for quantitative research, for qualitative research, more or less the same with slight uh, difference. Okay, I will show you another diagram. Again, uh, you see exactly the same stages. This is from another main uh, RM. RM stands for Research Methods Textbook Author. We have theory in the middle. You can choose your topic and then you need to narrow down your topic to become very focused, what we call research problem, and then design your study, including choosing your sample, choose your data collection techniques and whatnot. Once you have done that, you can proceed with data collection stage. After you have completed your data collection stage, you need to analyze your data accordingly. Next, you're going to interpret your data, inform others means you're going to write your research report. And normally after we have written our research report, we easily can transform the research report into maybe documentary, oral presentation and whatnot. All right, I want to highlight, uh, if you could see, I have put uh, this uh, stage, which is data collection in pink color compared to the other uh, data collection, sorry, other research stages. We wouldn't have time to go through all of the stages because in our department, we spend two semester okay, in order to complete all the stages in conducting research. So I just want to highlight one, which is data collection. 
Okay, so typically in social sciences, we have two uh, main research paradigm or research approaches, quantitative and qualitative research. So as my uh, many of you, I think, are uh, familiar, quantitative research, basically we're going to collect empirical evidences in the form of numbers. So the presentation would be in the form of graph, table, and whatnot. In contrast, if you do qualitative research, we're going to collect any kind of data which are non-numerical in nature. It could be in the form of words, images, audio, visual, and whatnot. Another uh, common difference between these two research approaches, quantitative research normally would able to accommodate a larger sample size. In contrast, for qualitative research, we would have a smaller sample size. There are many other uh, characteristics or differences between the two research approaches, but as I mentioned just now, we wouldn't have much time to discuss every uh, differences of these two research approaches. So basically, in social sciences, as well as definitely sociology, uh, we have our own data collection techniques. Like uh, for sociology and other social scientists, we use survey. So this is very common for us as sociologists. Experiment is commonly used or employed by psychology, psychologists. Okay. And then we have secondary analysis is basically a survey research, but survey which have been documented. So we have the original researcher and the second or third researcher will use the data, the survey data which have been collected by the original researcher. So this is what we call content so, uh, secondary analysis. Content analysis commonly used by our friends in mass communication department. But of course, other social scientists also would use this uh, data collection technique. Then uh, for qualitative, as I mentioned earlier, it's basically empirical data which we have collected in uh, any non-numerical form or format uh, like words okay, or visual data. So in sociology, and definitely our twin sister, anthropology, we have participant observation technique, in-depth interview, uh, focus group interview, and document analysis, just to name a few. Yeah, I will uh, merely highlight the three data collection technique which I have put it in red font. Right, uh, I did mention just now, I would share with you what were the data collection techniques used by uh, Ibn Khaldun in his book Mukadima, which, uh, as I mentioned just now, been spread into six chapters. So again, I'm using the same uh, reference by Fuad Bali. So in this book, you will find that uh, Fuad Bali has identified at least uh, there were three data collection techniques used by Ibn Khaldun, uh, which were one, uh, observation, and then historical method and comparative method. Even though he did not really specify the step, but the essence as we understood in the modern uh, science uh, research method, these were the three data collection technique employed by uh, Ibn Khaldun. So meaning to say collection of empirical data is not so alien in our tradition. It has been used by even the father of sociology, which is Ibn Khaldun, in his book on Mukadima. Okay, so I'm coming to the last section or subtopic of my presentation, which is the application of research. So basically, sociologists and other social research, uh, we basically conducted research in order to understand some of these factors like cultural, political, religious, psychological, and economic factors that could influence either individual behavior. If you are psychologists, if you are sociologists, we want to understand social behavior, social interaction, social structure, social institution. So for us, by conducting research, and we can better understand factors. Uh, which I have listed just now, so that we can offer more effective uh, intervention, uh, policy or evaluation in relation to the social phenomena that uh, we wish to study. So that is the importance of collecting empirical data so that we can offer any intervention program 
or we can improvise the previous uh, program, or we can suggest a new policy, or we can improvise the previous uh, policy, you know, uh, for the betterment of uh, mankind, okay, for our society. Okay, with that, I want to give a specific example using the data collection technique which I have listed just now. Mm -hmm. Like survey research, as I mentioned earlier, this is commonly used by sociologists. Not only by sociologists, this is also the most popular data collection technique by many social scientists, like uh, political scientists, okay, uh, psychologists, and so on. <clears throat> I'm sure many of you have participated in a survey research. Okay? So this is one example of survey research. Normally, we ask your demographic uh, background. Like your age, gender, race, educational background, and whatnot. Okay, so this is one example, uh, what we call employee satisfaction survey. Currently, many of the survey have been transformed into digital format. Okay, so you easily can participate in any online survey. Whereby the link to the online survey uh, definitely has been shared to you. So this is uh, the technical definition of survey research. A survey is a method of obtaining large amount of data. As I mentioned just now, this is quantitative research. So normally we can easily accommodate few hundreds uh, respondents. In fact, in some research, if you have a uh, high amount of funding, you can even interview up to 1,000 uh, respondents. So the main characteristic of, question, uh, of uh, survey research is the use of questionnaire. <laughs> Uh, as you can see on the screen now, this is example of questionnaire. Usually, uh, the data collected using questionnaire would be in a statistical form from a large number of people in a relatively short period of time. As I mentioned just now, we can get, uh, especially nowadays online uh, survey, we can get like 1,000 uh, respondents easily in a shorter period of time. So the main uh, characteristic of survey research is the use of questionnaire. And the main characteristic of questionnaire, uh, basically, you're going to find what we call closed-ended question. Uh, closed-ended question is just like MCQ question in the final exam. You have the answer given to you. So you, are, you need to choose the best answer that fit uh, your attributes or characteristic. Like this one, everything has been decided or being predetermined. The answer has been predetermined to you. Your job is just simply to tick which is the best. Okay, that fit you. Right, research application. As I mentioned just now, I want to share with you a few examples which relate to us as a Muslim. So as simple as we need to have a survey to know the status of religious practices among the Muslim. As basic as do you pray five times a day? So this is an example of one question in a questionnaire using survey research. Uh, this is a makeup data. Okay? It doesn't reflect any society or any country, so not to worry. So just imagine if you conduct this survey, okay, I want to show you the impact important uh, and the application, the practical application of survey research. So just imagine this particular society or village or suburb or town or country, the number of respondents who have answered 10% have performed their daily prayers, five times daily prayers. 65% mention only occasionally. And 25% mention hardly. Okay. So it should be an alarm. Okay. Red flag to, to us. Okay. As a Muslim society. Because this is so basic. But yet only 10% of the Muslim. Okay. Of X or Y or Z uh, city has performed the daily prayer. The five daily prayer. So that's why uh, we as Muslim scholar, 
uh, Muslim researcher have the obligation, okay, responsibility and amanah to collect basic data as such, such as this in order to move forward. In order, as I mentioned just now, to please Allah, okay, to be an effective vicegerent and whatnot. So, uh, this kind of statistic should be, of course, conveyed to our da'i. It has a direct implication to da'wah practices. So, after how many centuries and with the advance of technology, we have online classes nowadays, okay, online religious talk. You can basically at any time of the day, can tune to YouTube, okay, or Instagram or TikTok, uh, not to mention the traditional way of acquiring knowledge by attending talks in the mosque. But yet, we have only 10% of our Muslim perform five times basic prayer. So this kind of information should be fed to our da'i, I mean, to reflect whether, as I mentioned earlier, the strategy, the intervention, the way we deliver our talks, our tazkirah and whatnot, are they effective uh, enough to reach our audience and also, more importantly, to change their behavior in order for them to become a better vice chairman. Okay, a better humble Allah. Because this is so basic to us. Alright? Next, uh, participant observation. This is a qualitative research, uh, very unique to anthropology especially and also being used by uh, sociologists. So if you want to conduct a participant observation, you must be there in the group that you wish to study, the local group that you wish to study, the villages. Say for example, if you are thinking to study university population, then you must be in the research uh, location, which is the university, and mingle around with the university community. So you must be there for an extended period of time. What are you going to do there? Observing behavior, listening to what is said in conversation, both between others and with you as a researcher or field worker. And if possible, you ask questions. If anything you do not understand with the social activities or social behavior interaction that you have observed. So this is a qualitative research. Uh, these pictures basically were my own research when I did my PhD thesis on river pollution. I have two research settings, okay, the Kelang River and also the Torrens River. So as you can uh, see there, not only you need to observe the behavior of the participant, but also in some situation, we need to participate in the activities of the local people in order to gain better understanding, in order to collect the data empirically. So these were some of the activities that I have joined. Okay, I have visited uh, the trash rack together with an uh, officer from the Department of Irrigation and Drainage okay, in order to better understand the issue of river pollution at the Klan River catchment. I also have participated in the uh, river monitoring activities Okay, of uh, the Klang River catchment. And as I mentioned just now, my research is uh, cross-national study in nature. I also conducted participant observation at the Torrens River catchment in Adelaide. So this was me together with my uh, participant and interviewees. Uh, as I mentioned just now, one of the characteristics of using participant observation, you should participate in the routine activities of the local people. So here I've been working together with one of my participants. So when we participated in these activities, it's just not merely for the sake of participating. We're going to collect data. We ask questions informally. We observe and jotted down uh, what we call field notes, which later we're going to analyze. Right. So this is basically uh, a direct application. Uh, our Doctor just now mentioned about Makasit Sharia. So this is one aspect of Makasit Sharia to protect our mother earth. Okay, which uh, personally I think one of the least topic uh, being addressed by our Muslim scholar, protection of nature. Okay, 
uh, towards sustainable uh, future or sustainable environment. So you can use research technique in order to better understand how the Muslim interacted with nature, which of course has been created by Allah the Mighty. Do we really act as the steward of nature? Okay, to protect these uh, natural resources. Okay, uh, another example. Okay. You can also conduct participant observation. You participant, you become the participant. At the same time, you observe the behavior of the Muslim or also non-Muslim in regard to the Palestinian-Israel conflict issue. Okay, so I have uh, joined a few uh, demo okay, in KL. So you can see here from the river to the sea. So to what extent we support our brothers in Palestine? Of course, there are many forms of participation or support that we can give. Or as a participant observer, you can simply observe okay, this outlet. Okay. Uh, does the Muslim join this boycott campaign okay, in uh, McDonald's? So you can uh, conduct participant observation at Starbucks. Okay, or you visited a few groceries and see what kind of product being consumed by the Muslim society. Okay, and then typically for participant observer, we're going to jot down our field notes. So we can, of course, administer a survey, but sometimes we can also do what we call triangulation to add to the survey data. We do our participant observation to what extent we provide support to our Muslim brothers. So this is another way how we can use research in a practical uh, applied setting um, in this kind of uh, issues. Right, another one is uh, in-depth interview. Also another data collection technique I use for my PhD. This is the title of my PhD. Place people and pollution and urban ethnography of the Klang River in Kuala Lumpur. And the Torrance River in Adelaide. So what is in-depth interview? It is basically an interaction or con conversation between you as a researcher or interviewer with your participant. Sometimes we call our participant as interviewee or member in which the interviewer has a general plan of inquiry but not a specific or rigid set of questions that must be asked with particular words in a particular order. So it is being conducted in very relaxed manner. Okay. It's just like a typical day-to-day -day conversation. But as a researcher, you have an objective in mind to collect data, even though you do it in very relaxed manner or in very informal manner. But we do have our a mission in order to conduct our research, in order to answer our research questions. So this is some of my uh, re interview session. One, I have conducted my interview session even in a boat, okay, during a boat cruise with uh, a boat operator at the Torrance River. Another one, a picture of me with one of the local residents which have basically built his house along the Klang River in uh, Taman Melawati, just nearby our campus. Okay, this is another uh, example. Uh, just now, my own personal research, this is a published article. So you can see that uh, the title, this is uh, published in the Journal of Sociology of Religion. So, Becoming Muslim, the Development of a Religious Identity. Okay, you can see, I'm not sure whether you can see the uh, names of the author, Lori Pick. She is uh, an American uh, sociologist. Okay, so it is better to have as well, apart from this American sociologist, to have a Muslim sociologist as well to conduct a research about the Muslim in the US. Uh, what are the issues uh, we need to know? Okay, so development of religious identity. Uh, I have highlighted uh, the main data collection technique used by this researcher. She has used participant observation, focus group interview, and individual interview. So in my example for this slide is uh, individual or what we call in-depth interview. Right. So this is how we can use research in order to strengthen, in this case, 
the practicing Muslim of our brothers and sisters in the US. This is another good example of our own student. Uh, he is currently collecting his data. He already presented the proposal uh, last semester. The Productive Welfare Discourse of Zaka Institution in Malaysia, the Sociology of Knowledge Approach to Discourse. So uh, he is planning to interview 10 custodian of Zakat program in Malaysia and also 20 participants of Zakat recipient uh, in Malaysia, particularly in uh, Selangor and Wilayah Persekutuan. So this type of topic which uh, have an impact to us as Muslim society, we do not expect uh, the non-Muslim scholar to do the research for us. As you know, this research are extremely important. They are all the pillars of Islam, just to give you a few examples. So definitely we need the Muslim sociologists to come forward and to conduct their empirical research in order to better understand what are the challenges of both, in this case, Zakat institution and also the Zakat recipient. Okay. So that we can come up with better policy to address like poverty issues in relation to uh, zakat. This is a uh, uh, basically finding our research again being conducted by non-Muslim uh, sociologists. It is a longitudinal research, so that's why, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you need a patient. Okay, can you imagine you spend more than ten years to conduct the study? So, uh, in research, we call this. We call this longitudinal research, whereby we're going to collect data more than one time. Time one, time two, time three, time four, and so on. So it has been reported in Lebanon, about 43% admitted they do not practice Islam in their private life. And not to mention, certain percentages, about 23, have deconverted. I mean, have left our religion. Okay. So, uh, this is again another example on the importance for us to collect empirical evidence at the ground level. What are uh, actually happening to our society? Okay. Uh, in ideally, okay, we have, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, the guideline to be a practicing Muslim, to pay zakat, to perform prayers. But do our brothers and sisters perform these basic pillars of Islam, being a Muslim? Okay. And for the last research, it's even heartening to, to know that okay, some of our brothers and sisters have left our religion. And not to mention those who are not practicing uh, Islam uh, fully. So basically, uh, the application of research, for my understanding, is actually to narrow the gap between the revealed knowledge, what have been stated in the Quran and Sunnah. So as Muslim uh, social scientists and sociologists, we want to know what happened on the ground in the reality. We want to know how large is the gap. Okay, we have. The idea, of course, all of us need to follow the Quran and the Sunnah, the commandments. But what happened on the ground? So that is our responsibility. Is it this narrow or even very large gap, as mentioned by the uh, statistic just now, or even larger than that? So this uh, would be my last slide for us to ponder and also a kind of motivation for us as a Muslim scholar, Muslim researcher to conduct research uh, in regard to the issues that affect our society, not only the well-being of our Muslim society but also most importantly, fundamentally, our identity as a Muslim. Do we really practice Islamic teaching? Uh, with that, I thank you for your time. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.